this is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with author and photographer Dan Ephraim about his latest project, the Steve Keen Art Book. The work documents the lifestyle, motivation, and paintings of Steve Keen one of the world's most prolific artists who has sold or given away more than 300,000 paintings in his career. Guest essays by the likes of Shepard Ferry and Ryan McGinnis are interspersed with photos by Ephraim that document Keene's process. And now, painting a portrait of the prolific Steve Keene with author Dan Ephraim. much for joining us this week on the Art Sense podcast to talk about your new book project, the Steve Keen Art Book. And maybe a good place to start is how would you describe Steve Keen's artwork? Well, it's hard to describe Steve's artwork uh, without explaining or giving some context that he is perhaps the most prolific American artist of all time. Um, And so his artwork is a reflection in some ways about his production style as much as um, the work itself. He is a trained artist, but if you look at his work, you might see it as um, in more of an outsider feel to it it, for for various reasons. But he creates pieces in mass. And so he... He creates these, uh, these pieces that are eclectic, they're sometimes portraits, they're usually uh, sometimes uh, emulation of photos and pictures that he's either referencing directly um, or, of course, are in his mind. But he paints within a cage, a chain link fence, eight foot high, six wall, if you will, because there's an intersection as well, cage that acts as his easel where he's able to place between 40 and 60 pieces of wood, three-eighths-inch plywood, which acts as his his, his canvas, if you will, um, around the edges of this fence, this cage. And so he paints 40, 60 pieces at a time. And of those 40, 60 pieces, there's usually 15 different series. (laughs) So... It's hard to, so it's hard to, what does he do? Does he do portraits? Yes. Uh, for example, in the book, there's uh, a bunch of pieces by, uh, about presidents. He does a series of presidents, okay? Um, so those are portraits, but, you know, they're, 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 they're illustrations. They're, um, they're usually, uh, again, they're on, they're on three and plywood. They're usually acrylic. Um, and it's, it's somewhat, you know, it's, it, is it, is it realistic? Mm-hmm. Not really. It's it's not cartoonish uh, either, um, but it, it it has a flavor to it. I don't know if this really answers your question, but I'm trying to get there. Uh, he it, there's a number of different styles that he has. Uh, he, you know, he, uh, that, uh, that we can talk about. How did this project come together? How did you first meet Steve Keen? I first met Steve Keen. Um, his work through my love of. Uh, indie rock music in the 90s. Um, I basically ran into him and his work at almost every rock and roll show, rock show that I went to. He was selling affordable art at merch tables in New York City. I guess, you know, that that's a great segue into the relationship between Steve Keen's artwork and music, right? Yeah. A lot of his work is inspired by music. A lot of his work's inspired by album covers. And it seems like it's even gotten a little meta in that bands started reaching out to him for artwork for their albums, right? Yeah, he, he start, he's, he's from Charlottesville. And um, so he started there and he really developed this idea of... Um, I mean, just starting from the beginning, I guess, really is where we should with him and give some background. He started in Charlottesville. He went to school again for art. All this, he did all this work, and then he realized, like, you know, it's really difficult to to make to make living as an artist. How are you going to do that? What's the best way to do that? And he was just, you know, 
you know, from my long conversations with him, um, he was interested in, in just painting as, you know, why wouldn't you be if you're an artist? And he tried to figure out a way where he could create a niche for himself where he could paint as much as his heart desired and be able to somehow make a living at it. And he was a dishwasher for a while, um, and he was making, in essence, minimum wage or not much more than that. And he wasn't happy doing that, but he was happy painting. And his, his, you know, his ethos is a very simple one in, in some ways, and very and complicated in terms of how he actually delivers the work and thinks of the work. But his idea was, how do I, in essence, make enough to live uh, and still be able to paint? Simple, right? How do we do this? And his way was to, in essence, create mass pieces, you know, uh, paintings in mass, uh, affordably priced, so that you really, they're so cheap that you literally can't say no when you see them. Um, and you have to buy them. And again, and, and so that, in essence, in volume, um, he would, in essence, create his niche. And 30 years later, he painted over 300,000 pieces by hand. Hard to believe, but if you add it up, it actually works out. He does it does about 50 pieces a session, 200 a week, 30 years. You know, it, you can do the math if you want. It's more than 300. And so, um, it's it's a very, you know, it's a very interesting idea. This concept of how to be, how to you know how to be an artist in this world. And of course, his world started in the 90s. He didn't want to stay within the, the gallery count confines. He's fine with galleries it seems, but it wasn't really his thing. So, in a way, he doesn't really fit into that world. Um, occasionally he'll get a show at a gallery and that works out, but they have to treat it in, a, in usually a different way in order to sell affordable art like this, uh, uh, like he does. So how did the book as a project come together? Uh, the book came together as a I was curating a couple of shows for him just as a friend. I've been working with him, you know, on and off, just known him, hired him, commissioned him to do uh, paintings for some of my uh, musical artists that I represented as a manager. Um, I represented a band called The Apple Stereo and, um, and some other bands as well, and, and The Cosmetics, other bands that had commissioned him for artwork for the record covers. And... Um, so I've known him for a few years, and at one point or another, I just saw that he hadn't had a, a, a New York show in a while, and I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe I could pitch one for him. I did, and we did a show at the Brooklyn uh, Public uh, Library, uh, which was a really fantastic show in, in I think it was 2014. And then uh, I asked Steve some, for some of his favorite uh, artists, contemporary artists, and one of them he mentioned was Shepard Ferry. Um, as it would turn out, I, in 2015, I was in Los Angeles, and I had meant to get in touch with Shepard about doing a show. And this is a funny story, I think, or a good story. I think it reflects well on Shepard, actually. Um, I had done some work with Shepard previously, but didn't know him to, uh, enough to have a direct email or anything like that. Um, at the end of my business trip, I literally... You know, Eureka, I forgot to get in touch with Shepard Ferry about Steve. What am I doing? Um, so I, I didn't have an email. I went to the – Shepard has a gallery in Los Angeles called Subliminal Project. Mm -hmm. um, and I just went to the website and emailed info at Subliminal Project. I mean, I just – and put Steve Keen in the subject. And, you know, are you fans of Steve Keen was what I wrote. That was it. And – I didn't expect anything. I thought I had actually missed my opportunity because I was literally traveling home the next day on you know, my flight was booked. Sure. And I thought, well, I at least, you know, I should at least try and reach out. And lo and behold, um, Shepard himself responded to that email within, I think it was within 30 minutes. You know, wow. That's, that's what I remember. It might have been a little longer, might have been a little bit less even, but that's approximately right. And I was just blown away by that. He said, yeah, I'm a big fan. What, you know, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it ended up that he said, come by the office tomorrow and we'll, we'll talk about this. I basically said, I think he said, what can I do to help? That's what I think he said. And 
said, well, would you want to do a show? <laughs> Literally in the email, uh, the first email back to him. <laughs> right. And, uh, and he said, come in and talk tomorrow and let's, let's talk about it. And I changed my flight. I remember and went into the office and we met for a couple hours and immediately he gave me, you know, an opportunity to, of, of dates to talk to Steve about. And I was just blown away. So, I mean, literally this book happened because, really because Shepard jumped in and said, you know what, I'm going to put my, my flag in the, in, in the ground and say, I'm a Steve Keen fan. This guy deserves to, you know, be seen, be recognized. And when, you know, we, we went through the process of doing the show, um, I was taking photos of Steve's work. Steve doesn't archive his work. There's no real archive of what's going on. Wow. I was taking photos for the gallows because they want one for their catalog. Of course. Right. Even if they're going to sell it less expensively, they have a catalog. You know, I don't think they realized, maybe he did. I mean, no Steve, so he knew that he worked in that. But I had to, you know, there was, we delivered 800 pieces to the gallery. You know, um, 800 pieces wow. delivered to the gallery. <laughs> Talk about gallery show. Every inch of subliminal project from floor to ceiling was covered in CC. So I, had, I was the curator and arranged all this, supposedly, if that's what you call it. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so I was responsible for providing all the information. One of the things was taking photos. So I had to take photos of them all. And I thought, you know, when I got, when we finally did the show, I was so busy, I didn't really think about it. But as the show launched, um, I finally thought, like, wow, you know, there's a line out the door. People can't get in. We sold 600 or 550 pieces the first night. Wow. I mean, you know, like, it was just insane. And and I just thought, wow, you know, this would probably make an interesting book someday once I, you know, get over this. <laughs> once I get right. over this and get sleep for two weeks, like, this might make a good book. Um, and that's where the project, uh, you know, really started. It was like, wow, Shepard got behind this. There's a line out the door. He sold a lot of pieces anyway, and he has a fan base. Shouldn't he have a book? Right. And I was, I've just been inspired by Steve for so many years. I just thought, wow, I, who else is going to do this? I'm, I'm, this is it. This was, this was the moment. And I captured at least some of it. And so in the book, you know, you have essays written by guests, including Shepard, including Ryan McGinnis, who's another weighty name, you know, and, and Ryan's contribution was really interesting because it's, it's kind of an interview format. He's trying to help us peel back the, the onion in terms of what's going on in, in Steve's mind. And I think that interview kind of demonstrates that Steve is more than just a naive outsider, that he has put a lot of thought into what his practice and career is, right? Well, Brian has a long history with Steve as well, as, as you might have read. And um, and I think that piece that he did is just spectacular. I mean, Ryan, I've known for probably, actually, yeah, almost exactly as long as Steve. We worked on a project um together um i actually uh was at least partially responsible for introducing ryan to steve and um anyway as you if you know ryan you know he's a process hound like he just just feeds off of like how did you do this it's so inquisitive right and i one of the one of the things i love about ryan um and his work and and just how he presents Everything and I've and I've been very lucky to work with him on a number of of, of things, um, a number of projects. So having him write this um, was really amazing. Uh, I didn't think he was going to be able to do it at first, um, but as <laughs> sort of uh, fortunately, unfortunately, one of the happy uh, occurrences of the the book taking six and a half years to uh, produce um, <laughs> that it, there was finally a window where <laughs> where Ryan could actually uh, uh, write something uh, and, and it fit into the book on time. So right. that was one of the, the, the happy, happy uh, accidents of it taking so long to make. But uh, I just love the idea of 